Shalom, everyone. And the Nazarim, that's what we're called. There's something for the masses to see, and then there's something for the initiated to see. It's the darkness hiding in open view. We call them Wiccans, witches, warlocks, wizards, shamans. That's what they go by. It's poison doctrine. Well, welcome everybody. My name is Lou White and I have people out of town here and it's wonderful to see you all. And um, today we're going to be discussing a secret. Actually, there's several secrets, but uh, secrets have been kept from people and secrets have been kept from the adversary too. The adversary doesn't have all the knowledge, but Yahuwah has revealed quite a bit to his people that the adversary never expected, you know. Anyway, we're going to start with these terminologies. Those that are at home or watching this on a DVD can back this up or put it on pause to understand this, but we have traditional terms that we're not going to use and we have authentic Hebrew terms that we are going to use during the study so that you'll better comprehend what the words mean. Uh, we're not going to use the word L-O-R-D because it's just an English word and it actually defines itself in Hebrew as B-A-A-L. We're not going to do that. We're going to put his name in, Yahuwah, and the name of the son of Yahuwah is not J-E-S-U-S, which would be Jesus or the horse in Hebrew. Uh, it's actually Yahusha. It means Yah is our deliverer. And it could also be pronounced Yahushua or simply Yeshua. That's a shorter form. Just shortening a name doesn't make it evil, like Mike or Michael. It's not pr wrong. It's just that people do have controversies over that. Anyway, the word Mashiach will come up. That's the Hebrew term that the Greeks use the word Christos. And Elohim or El, uh, instead of G-O-D, that's a pronoun. And it means uh, basically mighty one. And the tribe that often are blamed for everything, the Jews, is actually Yehuda. And that's one tribe of technically 13 tribes. So you've got 12 tribes if you count Yosef as one. And the Yahudim is the royal line. That's where all the kings come from. And then we have the term Yisrael, which refers generally to all tribes together. And uh, in the scriptures, we see that there's a house of Yisrael, which is the northern ten tribes. And the house of Yehuda. Those are the two houses. But they will be united into one eventually. And then we have the word Torah. Now, that word Torah is the central message or way of Yahuwah, okay, that Abraham lived by and Enoch and all the people and all the prophets taught. That word has been translated into a more of a legal term called, we use the word law. And it has a moral uh, definition for sin to it, but it also is used in some cases as a ceremonial uh, prescription so we have uh, some distortion of understanding there. But uh, Torah is basically the Hebrew word that means instruction. Now, if we love one another, we'll be known as taught ones of Yahushua. So love is really the goal of the Torah. The Torah teaches us how to love Yahuwah and how to love our neighbor. Now, today's topic is, is called the secret. And it wasn't something I made up. This is something that came out of Scripture. Scripture actually reveals secrets. And um, Ephesians 3, verses 2 through 6, are an interesting text. It says, If indeed you have heard of the administration of the favor of Elohim that was given to me for you, that by revelation was made known to me the secret, as I wrote before briefly. In reading this, then you are able to understand my insight into the secret of Messiah, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his set-apart emissaries and prophets. And here's the one of the secrets. The Gentiles to be co-heirs, united in the same body, that's the body of Israel and partakers together in the promise in Messiah through the Besorah. 
the translations usually say the gospel. Now that's, that word just simply means message. Besorah is the message or the report. Now, uh, here's the thing. What has not been known, even to, to the present day, is that the Israelites are literally co-heirs on a number of levels because they are the nations. The Israelites are the nations. And how did that, that happen? Well, historians and ge uh, people that study geography identify a group of people called the Phoenicians. Now, the Phoenician is a, is a Greek term. It's two words put together, phoniki, phoniki, which means date palm. And Herodotus is the one that made that word up. He ascribed that term to a group of people who lived along the coast of what we call Israel. And he referred to those people as phoniki, which we get the word Phoenician from. No one has ever called themselves Phoenicians. That's an interesting thing. Phoenician is not in the scriptures. It's only from the writings of Herodotus that this originates. And he called the Israelites by this term. Now that included the Sidonians and Tyrians, which were pagans who worshipped B-A-A-L. But that was the sun. But the Israelites were also known by the term Phoenicians by the Greeks. And the Greek world uh, was growing and growing and growing and eventually overtook the whole Mediterranean as uh, an empire. And of course the term Phoenician was used to refer to these sea peoples that had colonies all over the earth, all around, uh, you know, they founded Carthage. And we know that the uh, city of Carthage in Northern Africa was actually founded by the Israelites, you know. And during the days of Elijah, or Eliyahu, uh, there were three and a half years of drought caused the people that were in Israel to leave and find water. And one of the things that they did was they left to the colonies, and Tarshish was a colony in southern Spain. Carthage, uh, I mean, yeah, Tarshish. And Carthage was in northern Africa. And they say it swelled to over a million people during the time of El Yahu's drought. Now that says something in itself. Well, the colonies were all the way up to Great Britain and even over to South America and the areas around Lake Michigan and all these people, they, they call them the Phoenicians, the Sea Peoples, because they traveled by boat. Well, they're the Israelites, and they have become the nations. Anyway, that's an interesting uh, text right there, uh, because they physically are co-heirs. And now they're being called back like the prodigal son, because they did literally leave like the prodigal son left. They're going to be engrafted into the commonwealth of Israel. Uh, now, the secret it's, uh, re it is mentioned again in Revelation 10. And then the messenger whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land lifted up his right hand to the heaven and swore by him that lives forever and ever, who created the heaven and what is in it, and the earth and what is in it, and the sea and what is in it, that there should be no further delay. But in the days of the sounding of the seventh messenger, when he is about to sound, the secret of Elohim shall also be ended as he declared to his servants, the prophets. Now, uh, this secret, this topic, is an extension of the one we had last month called the, the gospel. What is the everlasting gospel? And this is kind of dovetailing into that and explains further about that secret. Lawlessness has become institutionalized. Pretty much everybody would agree even especially in the religious institutions and the seminaries. But righteousness will be revealed. Um, everlast, the everlasting message. Now, the everlasting message is, in the Greek, it's euangelion, or besora, which was translated into the word gospel. Now, the word yom kafar is another topic that's in this text I want you to understand, or refer to. Revelation 14, 6 and 7 said, And I saw another messenger flying in mid-heaven, holding the everlasting good news. And that's the euangelion, or besora, the message. And it's apparently a secret. To announce to those dwelling on the earth, even to every nation and tribe and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, and this is what he said, Fear Elohim and give esteem to him because the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made the heaven and the earth 
and sea and fountains of water. Now, how do you fear Elohim? That's a big question. And how, how is it that you would give esteem to him? And what is the hour of his judgment? Well, judgment day is often referred to as the 10th day of the seventh month, which Christians have no knowledge of generally. Their pastors probably do, but the congregations don't. Yom Kafar is the name of the so the tenth day of the seventh month, which means the day of the covering. Yom means day. The day of the covering. And that is judgment day. It's when Israel returned all of the land that belonged to the families back to their original owners every seventh year. Debts were for every, every jubilee, every fiftieth year, I'm sorry. And every seventh year, all debts were forgiven. Okay? So that day was always a very prominent day. And it will be again because those are unfulfilled in the seventh month. The, the, uh, the first part of the seven festivals have been fulfilled, but the last four have yet to be fulfilled. If our conclusions don't agree with this, then they're false. Ecclesi Ecclesiastes 12, 13 and 14 says, let us hear the conclusion of the entire matter. In other words, what's the final outcome? Fear Elohim, there's that word again, and guard his commands, for this applies to all mankind. For Elohim shall bring every work into right ruling, including all that is hidden, whether good or whether evil. Now, interestingly enough, uh, the Nazarim is who we are. If you read Acts 24, verse 5, that's what we're called. And oddly enough, in that text, it was a pagan that was calling us that. It was uh, someone that was an unbeliever, you know. Anyway, the, uh, the fact is, there's two things that Nazarim do that were offensive to the, you know, the dragon. That is, we, we obey the commandments of Elohim, that's Yahuwah, and we hold to the testimony of Yahusha. Those two things are very uh, disturbing to people. And we're, we don't want to disturb them, we want to tell them what we have to do. Now, the secret is how to fear Yahuwah and guard his commands. The secret to how to do that lies in having Yahushua's mind in us. How do we fear Yahuwah and how do we guard his commands? We can't in our flesh. We have to walk in the spirit with his mind within us. We have, he comes to us and enables us to understand. Now, that means the Messiah is actually in us, giving us a, 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 a foretaste of his entire indwelling at the time we're really redeemed. But anyway, we have to overcome our selfish, possessive nature and allow his mind to control us. We can't do it without his mind. And it's, it re involves a renewing of our mind. See, because when we're born, we have nothing in us at all except the mind of the flesh and our perspective and our selfish attitudes. If those who teach us, now how are we deceived? Well, we're deceived by our false, the false teachers because they don't have the understanding that they need to have. They don't have Yahushua's mind in them. They, they study what his words are, but they don't have his mind in them, ruling over them, so that he, they can share what he wants to say. Now, if, if those who teach us don't agree with these conclusions, then they are misleading us, and not intentionally, necessarily. But in 1 Yahukin or 1 John 3, 8 through 10, that one doing sin is of the devil, because the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of Elohim was manifested to destroy the works of the devil, which is sin. Everyone having been begotten of Elohim does not sin, because his seed stays in him. I emphasize in him. As he is powerless to sin, because he has been begotten of Elohim. In this, the children of Elohim and the children of the devil are manifest. Everyone not doing righteousness is not of Elohim, neither the one not loving his brother. So the works of the devil is sin. In 1 Samuel 15.23, we learn that if we reject Torah, we might as well be witches and sorcerers. For rebellion is as the sin of divination. In many translations, it's witchcraft. And stubbornness is as wickedness and idolatry, because you have rejected the word of Yahuwah. He also does reject you as sovereign. He's talking to King Shaul there. 
Um, so we have to understand that this, these words might have been directed to one man at that time, but they still hold true to all of us. Now here's a, a little side note of some terminology. The word kabod in Hebrew basically means radiance. And it's usually translated G-L-O-R-Y. But the word kabod can be used as an acronym where the ka sound and the B sound and the D sound have, they stand for other words. Wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. So we have kokma, bana for knowledge, and da'ath for understanding. Now that's a little confusing, I know. But we can see it coming out of Proverbs, if you just read this text. Proverbs 2 says, My son, if you accept my words and treasure up my commands with you, so that you make your ear attend to wisdom, incline your heart to understanding. For if you cry for discernment, lift up your voice for understanding. If you seek her, that's wisdom, as silver, and search for her as hidden treasures, then you would understand the fear of Yahuwah and find the knowledge of Elohim. For Yahuwah gives wisdom out of his mouth come knowledge and understanding, and he treasures up stability for the straight, a shield to those walking blamelessly, walking blamelessly, to watch over the paths of right ruling and the way of his kind ones he guards. Then you would understand righteousness and right ruling and straightness, every good path for wisdom would enter your heart and knowledge be pleasant to your being. Discretion would guard you. Understanding would watch over you to deliver you from the evil way, from the man who speaks perversities, those who leave the paths of straightness to walk in the ways of darkness. Now there's two ways. The evil way or the way of Yahuwah. Abraham taught his household the way of Yahuwah. Now, Focus on, those, on that phrase. That is the, the, the way of Yahuwah is actually in the literal Hebrew is Shamar Derek Yahuwah. That's guard, Shamar, Derek, where we get our word direct from, straight path. And of course the path is the path of Yahuwah. Now that's uh, interesting. We're going to look at uh, what Abraham actually uh, where Abraham was spoken of by Yahuwah. Genesis, or Bereshith chapter 18, starting at verse 17, says, And Yahuwah said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? Now that's not a misspelling, actually it's more correct. Abraham is a, uh, the father of nations, and that's a plurality. So Abraham is really what it should be. Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? since Abraham is certainly going to become a great and mighty nation and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him for I have known him how do you know Yahuwah? through his covenant and so that he commands his children and his household after him to guard the way of Yahuwah. that's where I got that that text Shamar Derek Yahuwah. I got it from that sentence to do righteousness and right ruling so that Yahuwah brings to Abraham what he has spoken to him. He was about to explain to him, you know, uh, about the destruction of the city, you know. Well, anyway, there it is. Uh, now, the message. The message was given to Yisrael to teach mankind to heed. Believe it or not, Israel, or Yisrael, had a, had a commission, or co a commission, but it was a commission with Yahuwah to do something and they failed miserably and we have been failing because we are engrafted into Israel through the covenant and now we're waking up to our commission. What was it? Okay, it's called by different terms, gospel, which is more recent, that's kind of a 16th century term for it. It means uh, the good news or the good spiel. Euangelion, the Greek term for it, living words, that's what uh, Stephen called them in Acts chapter 7. The oracles of Elohim and the word Besora. But what is it? Well, we covered it last month in the, in the term gospel. Well, here it is. 
That was a little drum roll. Here is the retelling of the covenant for the lost tribes of Israel in the last days given at Deuteronomy 5, 6 through 21. I am Yahuwah, your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim, out of the house of bondage. You have no other mighty ones against my face. Number two, you do not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of which is in the heavens above or which is in the earth beneath or which is in the waters under the earth. You do not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, Yahuwah, your Elohim, am a jealous El, visiting the crookedness of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing kindness, that's kased, that's the word grace in the Christian world to thousands, to those who love me and guard my commands. Number three, you do not cast the name of Yahuwah your Elohim to ruin, for Yahuwah does not leave him unpunished who casts his name to ruin. Number four, guard the Sabbath day. The word guard is shamar in Hebrew. To set it apart as Yahuwah your Elohim commanded you, Six days you labor, and you shall do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of Yahuwah your Elohim. You do not do any work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor any of your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gate, so that your male servant and your female servant rest as you do. And you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Mitzrayim, and that Yahuwah your Elohim brought you out from there by a strong hand, and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, Yahuwah your Elohim commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. When the Native Americans of the uh, United States here, w before people understood who they really were, they are lost tribes. They actually have a seven day week and they have a Sabbath. And one of the things that's not well uh, known is the fact that when the Catholics got here and they lined up with some of the tribes, the French and the Indians, the French Catholics and the Indians, they were actually trying to wipe out the tribes that kept the Sabbath because that was really what was going on. The tribes were fighting each other and of course Rome would have come along and just ruled over the bloodbath that was left. But that's some, something that is a part of history that even the Native Americans generally don't know. But there are people that keep the, keep the seventh day down there. Yes. No, not so much Constantine uh, at that time, back in the days of the colonies. But Constantine was the root of the change. In 321, he did change the day of, of rest. Yeah. So he was indirectly involved, yes. Uh, now, number five is respect your father and your mother as Yahuwah your Elohim has commanded you so that your days are prolonged and so that it is well with you on the soil which Yahuwah your Elohim is giving you. Number six is you do not murder. Number seven is you do not break wedlock. Number eight is you do not steal. Number nine is you do not bear false witness against your neighbor. And number 10 is you do not, do not covet your neighbor's wife, nor do you desire your neighbor's house, his field, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, his ox, nor his donkey, or whatever belongs to your neighbor. Now the Catholics did away with the second commandment where we were prohibited from bowing to idols, they kept that one, I mean they did away with that one, and they turned this one into two commandments so that they could retain ten. The second commandment they don't have. So the third commandment to them is remember the Sabbath day, which to them is Sunday. So they did a little bit of a obfuscation there. Now continuing right along from Deuteronomy 5 right into Deuteronomy 6, Hear, O Yisrael, Yahuwah our Elohim, Yahuwah is one. And you shall love Yahuwah your Elohim with all your heart and with all your being and with all your might. And these words, the ones that we just read, which I am commanding you today shall be in your heart. And you shall impress them upon your children and shall speak of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. And shall bind them as a sign on your, right, on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. And you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Um, now, uh, the, the code breaker for, our, for us is always Torah, the instructions of Yahuwah. That's, our, that's the way we discern what we're to do. 
It doesn't matter what our teachers say. If our teachers tell us you don't have to do that, that's the dragon talking. Because the, we just read the Ecclesiastes said that, that the, the Torah is for all people all over the earth, They're for everyone. So we have to filter everything through the Torah, the perfect unchanging truth. So the message is the secret of Elohim. Today it's called the gospel. Now, this is something that's um, spoken of in Luke 3, and that is uh, the words of Yahushua's cousin. They call him John the Baptist. He says, and even now the ax is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Now, the fire is, of course, a destruction of their existence, and that refers to the lake of fire, the Yamesh. But what does the word axe refer to? These are code words. The axe refers to the Torah, the instructions that we just read. That's the axe. And why would that have an effect on the other, the other parts of this sentence? Trees. The ax is going to come in contact with trees. What are trees? Well, trees are false religions. Actually, any religion is a tree. Uh, because we're not living a religion. We're living a reality, a relationship. It's not a religion. It's a relationship, the covenant. Now, the ax is going to wipe out destroy forever these trees and they're going to be thrown into the fire because they don't produce good fruit because Yahuwah said that in Ecclesiastes once again that every single thing is going to be analyzed whether it's good or it's bad it's evil or it's good so if it isn't good then it's not going to be retained now Israel has always carried the secret the secret is the covenant and that's been what the dragon has been fighting against. He's been, the dragon fights against the Nazarene tooth and nail because it, the dragon does not want the covenant to be known. He doesn't want anyone to obey the covenant because that would mean that they're not obeying the, the dragon. Oops. Now, Yisrael's co-mission. The message is our mission to teach the covenant of love, which is Torah, for all of Israel's existence, we have been a nation of priests for the nations to train them in righteousness. And we've failed to perform that function very well, but with Mashiach in us, the secret of the ages, he will fulfill that mission through us, and then the end will come. Now, we're not going to fulfill the mission. We, we're going to let him do that because he's the only one that can, and he's going to do it through us. We have to transmit the, mission, the, the message. The, the message has been limited to the death, burial, and resurrection. That's something that everybody needs to know. Yes, that's the atonement. But what about the actual walking as he walked? And the Greek mind only wants to believe. But we have the Hebrew understanding that not only belief in our minds, but, but manifestation of our belief and our walk that that perfects our belief, you know. So if you, if you believe something mentally, like a Greek would, that's not going to get anything done. It's, a, it's without purpose. So we have to actually do the word. So when you do the word, then you have perfected your faith or your belief. And he, he said in one text that when this is done, finally, it's uh, I think in Matthew chapter 24, he says, when that mission is done, when the, when the message has been preached or proclaimed in, throughout the entire world, the end would then come. Uh, we can't do it in our own, uh, on our own, though. In Matthew 24, verses 11 through 14, it says, and many false prophets shall arise, now that's uh, including teachers, and lead many astray. Now, focus on that, lead many astray. And because of the increase in lawlessness, which is as opposed to obedience, the love of many shall become cold, but he who shall have endured to the end shall be saved. And this good news, or message, of the reign shall be proclaimed in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end shall come. Now, how is it that we're led astray? And what are we led astray from? Well, we're not led astray from freedom, 
to do as we like. See, the, the Satanists say, do as thou wilt. Harm none, do as thou wilt. Well, that's pretty loose. But here's the thing, that's not of Yahuwah. Yahuwah doesn't say to do as thou wilt. He said, obey me, okay? And you will be blessed. But here's the thing. How is it that we're led, what are we led astray from? We're led astray from the covenant. That's pretty obvious. And we have been led astray, and uh, seminaries are, are teaching men to lead people astray in bulk. That's what they go there for, the seed factories, the seed plots. Now, if we're, if we're t being led astray, who's doing it? Well, the teachers are doing it, because we're not hearing the teachers that are teaching the truth. They, they have partial truth. And that's the thing, they masquerade as messengers of light, but they're really not. The secret is revealed in part right here, and this is very important. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 27 and 28, Shaul wrote these words, To whom Elohim desired to make known what are the riches of the esteem of this secret among the Gentiles, which is Messiah in you our Mashiach, in you, the expectancy of esteem whom we announce, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom in order to present every man perfect in Messiah Yahushua. Now how are you going to teach them if you just say, if you stay on the subject of death, burial, and resurrection and don't teach them the, the covenant? Well, it's kind of a losing proposition because you can't teach someone how they're sinning in First Yahukanan or First John chapter three, uh, was it chapter three, verse four? Um, it says that sin is lawlessness. So if you don't know how to define sin, then you can't find out what lawlessness really is. So anyway, in Jeremiah thirty-one or Yirmiyahu thirty-one, it says, "For this is the covenant I shall make with the house of Israel after those days," declares Yahuwah. I shall put my Torah in their inward parts and write it on their hearts and I shall be their Elohim and they shall be my people. See the Messiah in you brings with him the covenant so he's in you and he writes his covenant and a love for the covenant upon your heart because you can't obey it with, unless you love it. Now so there's the key right there. That's the key secret right there. In uh, Yahukan in chapter 20 starting in verse 21 we read then Yahushua said to them again, Peace to you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. So that's a serious, heavy commission. And having said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the set-apart spirit. The spirit came out of him, and he breathed on them the spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. And that has to do not so much with them at all. It has to do with the recipient, the type of soil that they are. When they are, uh, teach the commandments to people and they reject them, then the, re the sins that are in those people are retained. And we recognize that and we can say it. That say, well, if you keep walking this way, then sin abides on your head and the wrath of Yahuwah is upon you. But you can repent at any time, you know. See, without repentance, there is no forgiveness. If Yahushua is not inside, you're not his. Romans 8 verse 9 says, But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of Elohim dwells in you. And if anyone does not have the spirit of Messiah, this one is not his. Now, we're to be controlled by the actual mind of Yahushua. In 1 Yahukun and 1 John 3, verse 8 through 10, it says, The one doing sin is of the devil, because the devil has sinned from the beginning. Now, we've already read this, but I want to emphasize it again. For this purpose, the Son of Elohim was manifested to destroy the works of the devil, which is sin. Everyone having been begotten of Elohim does not sin, because his sin stays in him. And he is powerless to sin because he has been begotten of Elohim. In this, the children of Elohim and the children of the devil are manifest. Everyone not doing righteousness is not of Elohim, neither the one not loving his brother. 
And Yahushua also said, by their fruits, you will know them. So it's about what our mind is on. Romans 12 says, I call upon you, therefore, brothers, through the compassion of Elohim, to present your bodies a living offering, set apart, well-pleasing to Elohim, your reasonable worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you prove what is that good and well-pleasing and perfect desire of Elohim. Not our desire, but his. And it says in Psalm 1-2 that, that backs this up. But his delight, that's our delight, the man who loves, who, who dwells on the Torah. His delight is in the Torah of Yahuwah, and he meditates in his Torah day and night. Now, if Christian pastors were able to see this, that they wouldn't, they wouldn't remain Christian pastors. They'd become not serene because that's what we do. We, we, we obey the commandments of Elohim, and we hold to the testimony of Yahushua. See, because uh, that's what the first fruits are spoken about in Revelation chapter 12 and 14. Now, it's a veiled message to those who are perishing. In other words, if they just have a belief in Yahushua's sacrifice, and, and they understand that he resurrected, but they do not walk as he walked, they're living in a veiled world. They, their, their, their mind is veiled to some, some important facts. In 2 Corinthians 4 it says, and indeed, if our good news, that's our message, has been veiled, it has been veiled in those who are perishing, in whom the mighty one of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, so that the enlightening of the good news of the esteem of Messiah, who is the likeness of Elohim, does not shine on them. For we do not proclaim ourselves, but Messiah Yahushua, the Master, and ourselves your servant for the sake of Yahushua. For Elohim said, let light shine out of darkness is the one who has shown in our hearts for the enlightening of the knowledge of the esteem of Elohim in the face of Yahushua Messiah. So he's talking about Messiah, once again, being in you, see, has shown in our hearts. It's, we're not proclaiming anybody in us except Messiah Yahushua. That's who's in our heart, and that's who speaks th through us. Now, he is the treasure. The spirit is in earthen vessels. And we have this treasure in earthen vessels. That's our bodies. Now, we're not talking about rubies and sapphires and diamonds. We're talking about something et infinitely more valuable. Something that will be around forever. Because that stuff can perish. That stuff is perishable. And we have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the excellence of the power might be of Elohim and not of us, being hard-pressed on every side but not crushed, being perplexed but not in despair, being persecuted but not forsaken, being thrown down but not destroyed, always bearing about the body, the dying of the Master Yahushua, that the life of Yahushua might be also manifested in our body. So Yahushua's life can be, a, can be witnessed in us. Okay. In Deuteronomy 29, verse 29, it says, The secret matters belong to Yahuwah, our Elohim, but what is revealed belongs to us and to our children forever to do all the words of this Torah. See, what was revealed was the secret of the Torah. That's what he's talking about. You know, there it is. It was revealed to us and to our children forever to do all the words of this Torah. Psalm 25, the secret of Yahuwah is with those who fear him. That means respect him. And he makes his covenant known to them. What? That's the secret, the covenant. But we're fishers of men, and the nations are the fish. So we have to find those people who will listen, tell them the name of the Creator, and then teach them to guard his commandments. That's what we were commissioned to do when he, that was one of his final words. The secret counsel, and we've heard of this term too. That's Yahuwah's Torah, his covenant. Proverbs 3 again, do not envy a cruel man and choose none of his ways, for the perverse one is an abomination to Yahuwah, and his secret counsel is with the straight. Now, here's an interesting thing uh, to emphasize the idea that Messiah is in us, okay? 
And it's spoken of in Yirmiyahu 31, which is one of my favorite chapters. A woman encompasses a man. Well, that's because the woman is Israel, and the man is Yahusha within her. In Yirmiyahu 31, verses 22 and 23, it says, Till when would you turn here and there, O backsliding daughter? That's the nation of Israel. For Yahuwah has created what is new on earth. A woman encompasses a man. Thus said Yahuwah of hosts, the Elohim of Yisrael. Let them once again say this word in the land of Yehuda and in its cities, when I turn back their captivity. Yahuwah bless you, O home of righteousness, mountain of set-apartness. Now, when he turns back their captivity is when he returns. That's when the captivity ends. We're in captivity because we're not in the land. If we go back to the land, we're still in captivity because he didn't return us there. When he returns us there, we're going to fly up into the air. And then we're going to meet him and then we're going to come down and we're going to remain with him forever. That hasn't happened. That's the end of our captivity. And when, he, when that happens, we're, uh, he says, when I turn back their captivity, you who have blessed you, a home of righteousness, mountain of set-apartness. That's the new Jerusalem, the home of righteousness. And guess what? We're going to be the new Jerusalem, and guess who's inside of us? Yahusha. He's inside the woman. You know. What we are seeing through this entire chapter concerns the final process of restoration and redemption of both houses of Yisrael into one. The house of Yehuda and the house of Yisrael united to Yehusha at his return when he ends the captivity of both Ephraim and Yehuda, the two houses. The Nazarim are identified by name in verse 6. And the regathering is described as the chapter unfolds. What is particularly fascinating about verse 22 is it hints at the secret, which is Mashiach in you, quoted below from Colossians 1, 27 and through 29. It is Yahushua that circumcises our inner beings, which is our lamp or our heart, with a love for his Torah, so he dwells within us from that time forward. Thus, a woman, that's us, his bride, Israel, truly does encompass a man who is our redeemer, Yahushua. The backsliding daughter in the text of Yirmiyahu 31 is Yisrael. A woman is also Yisrael. A man is Mashiach Yehusha, ruling in the woman's heart. Encompasses means restored to, or embraces, reunited, joined together. The next verse describes the outcome of this restoration, which is the ending of Yisrael's captivity among all the nations at the return of Yehusha, and the new Yerushalayim, the home of righteousness. The righteousness would not be possible unless the relationship is restored through the covenant. And for the renewal of the covenant, it is necessary for the man to be inside the woman, living in her heart. And that woman is Yisrael, and the secret is Mashiach in you. And that's where we're going to be. That's our ultimate goal. That's our current reality, if we've been immersed in the name, and if we keep his commandments and hold to the testimony of Yahushua. It's our current reality. It's not a religion. It's a relationship. And that's our ultimate destination as well. Uh, Yirmiyahu 31, 33 says, For this is the covenant I shall make with the house of Yisrael after those days, declares Yahuwah. I shall put my Torah in their inward parts and write it on their hearts, and I shall be their Elohim, and they shall be my people. So he writes his Torah on our hearts. Now, it doesn't say anything about what Catholicism teaches or any of the Christians teach. It's just not there. Did you have a question? Yeah. Um, after those days, what, what is that particularly a reference to? Do you have any idea? After those days? Well, it says, after those days, I will make come into the house of Israel. Well, no. Mm-hmm. Well, I think he's talking about after 
everything said and done, uh, you know, meaning all the fulfillment of prophecy, Yahushua comes back, fulfills the, the uh, shadows of the seventh month, and redeems, it, and redeems his people, you know. The first fruits are the first, and then the uh, rest come, you know, later during the tribulation. Yes, we're still in the we're midst of. Struggling against flesh, our flesh. Oh yes, oh yes. After the fulfillment, we'll be able to accept them because he's transformed us. Well, exactly. Yes, and he will be in us so so amazingly, in such a full way, that he's going to be actually. He's already omnipresent, but he's going to be in, living in living stones. You know. Right. So while we're still fleshly and sinning, he can't, he can't necessarily yeah. dwell Yeah, we're still being tugged on every side by our flesh and by the people around us and the environment that we live in. And we're, just, our feet are dirty, but we're still clean. Uh, he cl continually cleanses us from sin. Uh, and our sinful nature is still there. We're still wrestling with it, with our own self. Our inner self is saying no, and our flesh is saying yes. <laughs> yes. Another question. Any other questions? Okay. Now, uh, in in the book of John or Yahukadin, chapter eight, verses thirty-one and thirty-two. So Yahushua said to those Yahudim who believed in him, if you stay in my word, that's his covenant, you are truly my taught ones, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. In Romans 6, 16 it says, do you not know that to whom you present yourselves servants for obedience, you are servants of the one whom you obey, whether of sin to death or of obedience to righteousness? That's very that that's one of the things that grabbed my eyeballs in 1985, and I said, "What? Uh-oh!" You know, because they were teaching me uh, legalism was a problem, and I said, "What? That's legalism." Uh, you know, that's what they call legalism, but legal being legal is a good thing. The secret of why we can obey: How could we possibly obey? Well, Colossians one addresses that. In verse 27, to whom Elohim desired to make known what are the riches of the esteem of this secret among the Gentiles, which is Mashiach, or Messiah, in you, the expectancy of esteem, whom we announce, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that's knowing the commandments, in order to present every man perfect in Messiah Yahushua, for which I also labor, striving according to the working of him. There it is. Emphasize it for me. Um, according to the working of him who works in me in power. So there it is. Salvation is highly conditional. We must repent. If you think that it's not conditional, then they're lying to you. Because if you don't repent and turn back and obey, then you're going to perish. Uh, when you love the commandments, that you, you will live by them because the commandments are living and active. They're actually alive because they are in the, he is the Torah. He's the living word. And when he comes into us, it says right here, Shaul says that his, uh, he's striving according to the working of him who works in him, you know. Mashiach in you is the secret. And it's overlooked by the fathers at the school of Alexandria where Christianity was invented. Now this is not a, happy thing to see, but some people, they don't know that Christianity was invented by the school of Alexandria, the catechetical school of Alexandria. Look it up on the internet. Anyway, the power, which is the energizing force, not the force of the, uh, you know, the one they use in the Star Wars thing, but it's the power and personality of Yahushua residing in each one of his followers, the Nazarene. His spirit does not reside in a hierarchy chosen by men. You can't just say, I want to be a member of that group, and then go to a school, and then get ordained, and then say, that's it. That doesn't work, you know. So popes, priests, and seminary trained men are not how the spirit operates. 
We are his body. We're his arms and his legs and his eyes and his ears. And uh, now this is a, another manifestation here, an illustration of the, what, the, what the, the menorah is, the seven branch candlestick or lampstand. It, it's a, an embodiment of uh, Yahusha being the root and we're the branches. And the two fig trees are the house of Israel and the house of Yehuda. And this thing that's connecting them was mentioned, I believe it was in Zechariah chapter 4, if you all want to do some background research, the shibboleth. The shibboleth is actually a connecting tube that, that actually physically connected the, uh, in, the, in the vision, you know, these two trees to the lampstand and the oil lamps. But anyway, shibboleth was also termed, if you look this word up on the internet, shibboleth is an encryption code. It's a secret password almost and in fact there was a, a case in the scriptures if you look it up uh, in your concordance you'll see that the, the house of Ephraim was I think they lost tens of thousands of men because they couldn't pronounce the word shibboleth and they were revealed <laughs> for something and they were that was a an encryption code so it was a you know, something to look at. It, it's, it's really, a, it applies pretty nicely to this whole expose. But connection to the root allows him to bear fruit in us. So if we're connected to the root, then we can bear much fruit. If we're not, then we're not going to be able to bear good fruit at all. Not serene, the word means branches, as in descendants of his teachings. That's what, it isn't so much tree branches, but it's offspring. You know, but it can apply to tree branches too. But uh, the reason the message is not known is because it is a secret. Matthew 13, starting in verse 34, says, Yahushua said all this to the crowds in parables. And he did not speak to them without a parable, so that what was spoken by the prophet might be fulfilled, saying, I shall open my mouth in parables. I shall pour forth what, was, what has been hidden from the foundation of the world. So the parables concealed the message from the masses, and it was due to their stubborn hearts. <clears throat> the covenant is the secret. The secret, now this is a, one I've, I've quoted already once today, but Psalm 25, 14. The secret of Yahuwah is with those who fear him, and he makes his covenant known to them. And... Uh, Yeshayahu 61 verse 11 says, For as the earth brings forth its bud, as the garden causes the seed to shoot up, so the master Yahuwah causes righteousness and praise to shoot up before all the nations. So the covenant is the seed that produces fruit. You have to understand these code words. And the fruit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the Spirit. And Galatians 5, 7 says, you were running well. Who held you back from obeying the truth? And Yermiyahu 10, 25 says, pour out your fury upon the heathen that know you not and upon the families that call not on your name. That's uh, amazing. And, and the prophet Yael, or Joel 2, verse 32 says, and it shall come to pass whoso, whoever, whosoever shall call on the name of Yahuwah shall be delivered. So the name is part of the secret message. It hasn't been well known. And I, I know that many of you know that the uh, current Pope of Rome has forbidden the name to be spoken aloud or referred to in any of the songs or teachings. In the, the Encyclopedia Americana 1945 says under this, under the topic G-O-D, G-O-D, the common Teutonic word for personal object of religious worship, formerly applicable to superhuman beings of heathen myth. On conversion of Teutonic races to Christianity, the term was applied to the supreme being. Mm -hmm. So our co-mission is to carry the message to the nations. Israel's mission has always been to carry the message of Torah to the nations. Torah is a message of love and deliverance from the works of the devil through the death, burial, 
and resurrection of Yahusha. The resurrection of Yahuwah, of, of Yahusha, is the uh, key to how we have his life in us. Because if he's still dead, then he's not in us. The sacraments can't compete with Yahuwah's Torah. Many of you probably don't know what the sacraments are, but it's the invention of Rome. The sacraments are non-existent, but they think that that's the way of salvation. But they can't compete with Yahuwah's Torah, so we will be persecuted for the sake of righteousness. That's part of why we're persecuted and have been persecuted. This is a picture of the Nazis arresting some uh, Yahudim. So at the end of the age, the, obe the bride will obey and, and is regathered. In Deuteronomy 30, we hear about this regathering, you know. And it shall be when all these words come upon you, that's the words of the covenant, along with the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, and you shall bring them back to your heart among all the Gentiles, where Yahuwah your Elohim drives you, that's where he scattered them, and shall turn back, that means to repent, to Yahuwah your Elohim and obey his voice according to all that I commanded you today with all your heart with all your being you and your children then Yahuwah your Elohim shall turn back your captivity and shall have compassion on you and he shall turn back and gather you from all the peoples where Yahuwah your Elohim has scattered you if any of you are driven out to the farthest parts under the heavens, from there Yahuwah your Elohim does gather you, and from there he does take you. That's what the uh, Christians call the rapture. It's just a matter of timing, though. It has to happen that we repent, and then he returns for us. And that's at the time that we're, that we're regathered. I think the operation is happening now. I mean, we're, we're, happen we're coming back to the covenant. See, when, the words, when these words come upon you, when the covenant is heard, you know, and you're actually hearing the words of the covenant, and then you say, I'm turning, I'm turning back. And then you become a, har a harvest worker. You're actually part of the harvest workers. You spread that, and you say, the truth is this. They've been telling us not to obey. The dragon has been saying, legalist, legalist, you're a legalist. Don't obey. Only Jews have to obey. You're a Christian. You're free. You have liberty. See, that's the dragon. We have to t teach them the truth and say, but I love the commandments. I'm not arguing with you. I'm just saying that I want to obey. And it, when you do that in their presence, maybe the Spirit will work through their heart and, and pierce their heart. And they will say, I want what you have. I want, th I want that desire that you have for the commandments. And that's the point where they'll say, I need to get immersed. And that's, that's what we're here for. Yeah, so the operation is still underway. But we're the harvest workers. And that's, the, that's when the rubber meets the road, is when you're one-on-one -on -one with somebody, somebody that is struggling to understand. And they see that they're in desperate need of something. Mashiach has to come into them. Now, he's not going to come into somebody and then not change them. You know, He's going to change them. Now, we're cleansed by obeying the truth, the living word, which is the Besorah. The living word, remember, was referred to by Stephen in chapter 7 of Acts. But you have to also remember the living word is a person. It is Yahusha. 1 Peter 1, 2, 1 2 starts out saying, Now that you have cleansed your lives in obeying the truth through the Spirit to unfeigned brotherly love, Love one another fervently with a clean heart, having been begotten from above, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the living word of Elohim, which remains forever, because all flesh is as grass, and all the esteem of man is the flower of the grass. The grass withers, and its flower falls away, but the word of Elohim remains forever, and this is the word announced as good news to you. So the Torah equals or is the living words. Acts 7, this is the part I've been referring to. This is, this is the Moshe who said to the children of Israel, Yahuwah your Elohim shall raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. Him you shall hear. This is he who was in the assembly in the wilderness with the messenger who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the living words to give to us 
to whom our fathers would not become obedient, but thrust away, and in their hearts they turned back to Mitzrayim. So surely Stephen was referring to the Ten Commandments, that, and Christianity has likewise thrust away these same words. The first four are really problematic for them. So our commission is very simple. It's our ordained marching, marching orders. Matthew 28, one of the last things that Yahushua said in his resurrected body, to emphasize what he was saying to us, the message. He's, he's telling Israel, once again, do your job. Teach the nation. Matthew 28, therefore go and make taught ones of all the nations, like they'd always been supposed to do, immersing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the set-apart Spirit, teaching them to guard all that I have commanded you, and see I am with you always until the end of the age, Mashiach in you. See, I am with you. I'm, he means I am not only with you, but I am in you. And I'm going to do this through you. See? So we're finally getting that commission. That's a commission. It's him working through us. So we're to find learners who will hear. Teach them the name. Teach them the Torah of Yahuwah. The way of Yahuwah. And here's Columbo. That makes sense, sir. Now, a last, uh, this is an everlasting message. Revelation 14, verse 6 and 7. And I saw another messenger flying in mid heaven, holding the everlasting good news to announce to those dwelling on the earth, even to every nation and tribe and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear Elohim and give esteem to him, because the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made the heaven and the earth, the sea and sea and fountains of water. Now, how do we worship him? Let us hear the conclusion of the entire matter. Fear Elohim and guard his commands, for this applies to all mankind. For Elohim shall bring every work into right ruling, including all that is hidden, whether good or whether evil. Ecclesiastes 12. And you thought you were going to get away without seeing Al Gore. We always try to get a little snap of him in, because I like him a lot. He's one of my... Uh, you know, uh, not, not an idol, but he's one of these people that I'm concerned about. You know, I think he's got a good heart, but he's just, you know, he's just out there searching for something. He's searching for love is what he's searching for in all the wrong places. <laughs> uh, remember, how, you, how are we deceived? Okay, how are we deceived? All right. Add to Torah. Take away from Torah. Either of those two will take care of that. If you add to it or take away from it, then you're deceived. That's how they trick us into doing things wrong. Remember how to be restored. Well, in 2 Chronicles 7.14, And my people upon whom my name is called shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their evil ways. Then I shall hear from the heavens and forgive their sin and heal their land. Renew your mind with truth and turn away from false teachings. Now, not serene, that's a word that some of you out here, uh, either watching this or sitting here, don't know what that means. The not serene is the original term for the followers, the first followers of Yahushua, of Nazareth. Nazareth was a city on a hill that meant watchtower. It was able to see the entire surrounding area, but not serene become our name, and if you'll see it written in Acts 24, verse 5, if you just look in your scriptures, uh, we're called that. And uh, we guard the word and the name. And that's interesting because we hold to the testimony of Yahushua and we obey the commandments of Elohim and we teach them. Psalm 138, verse 2, I bow myself towards your set-apart temple, or heckle, and give thanks to your name for your kindness and for your truth. For you have made great your word and your name above all. So he's not saying the name is better than the word, the word's better than the name. He's not talking about that. He's referring to the first part of this. He gives thanks to your name 
for your kindness and for your truth. The truth is his Torah. So you see he's got two things up here, the Torah and the name, and down here we've got the Torah and the name. So you've made great your Torah, which is his word, Debar or Debarim. Because we're guardians, the word Nazarene or Nazarim, the Nazarim means guardian or a protector or watchman. We're watchers, we're watchmen, and we watch over the name and we watch over the, the Torah. And we're guardians of the name and the, wor and the word. Now, this is going to really embolden some of you that may be a little bit shy. But remember, he who is within you is greater than he who is in the world. Doesn't matter who it is you're standing before. You could be standing before a man possessed by the dragon, but he trembles because of who you are and because of who's in you. Okay? It doesn't matter. We can't be arrogant, though. We have to be humble. Every place your foot stands upon is ours. Okay? Where's our foot standing? It's ours. Because Yahuwah is with us, but also because what belongs to him also belongs to his children because we're his heirs. In fact, we're his inheritance, and he is our inheritance. And in, in the book of Yahusha, or Joshua as they call him in, ver, in chapter 1, verse 3, every place on which the sole of your foot treads, I have given you as I spoke to Moshe. And he's speaking to all Israel. And in the same book in chapter 14 verse 9 so Moshe swore on that day saying the land on which your foot is trodden is your inheritance and your children's forever because you have followed Yahuwah my Elohim completely okay he's actually in this text he's referring he's actually speaking to his old buddy you know Caleb Caleb and, and Yahusha were the two spies and he and Caleb came to him when he was like 85 years old. And he was in there and he came up to Yahusha, Joshua, and said, what about my inheritance? And, he, and this is his answer that, that, that he gave him. So this 85-year-old man is asking for his inheritance. And he said, every place where your foot has trodden is your inheritance. But he's referring in this case to the land. But of course, the entire earth will be the inheritance of his children because the entire earth is going to be as the Garden of Eden. You know, it won't just be a small spot, you know. Yes, sir? So is that like uh, when you return? Mm -hmm. Right, so when he, when, he, when he returns? When he returns. Is, is it going to be like, a, like totally spiritual? No, he, he's going to be physical. We're, we're going to be transformed and have bodies like Yahusha, but we'll, it's, it, we're in captivity right now. So we're actually uh, captives. And the one that's ha we're in captivity under the dragon's authority right now. Because see, the dragon, although our spirits are free, our, our lives are still in captivity physically, but our spiritual, we are freed spiritually right now. But uh, when, when everything catches up with everything else and we're revealed to the universe, the sons and daughters of Elohim are going to be manifested and revealed at his return. So that is going to be a magnificent day like no other. There, it's going to be an incomparable event. It's going to be the second exodus. See, when we came out of Mitzrayim, we were a ragtag bunch of people. And, uh, but it was still a massive deliverance, miraculous. But the, the big deliverance is still ahead. It's going to pay, make that one pale. The, the deliverance that, we're, that is ahead of us when, you, when Yahushua returns is going to transform our bodies are going to change and be clothed with immortality. Our spirits are, within us are going to be fully um, take on the character of Yahushua's mind. See, right now all we get is a little voice. But when he, when he comes to, to really indwell us in, in full, it's going to be like like him walking around everywhere, you know. Only we'll be sort of in the sidelines, but we're going to be so thrilled. All we'll feel is joy. You know, that's, that's all we can say. Um, now, we're vessels of light because we bear the, the Torah in us, and we carry the message, which is the everlasting covenant. 
and we're supposed to awaken and trim our lamps. Uh, our hearts have to be tuned to, to the Torah. Now, Revelation 12, 17 says, and the dragon was enraged with the woman, that's Yisrael, and he went to fight with the remnant of her seed, those who guard the commands of Elohim and possess the witness of Yehusha, Messiah. So that's, uh, that's one of our main problems, is uh, the dragon is always after us. And uh, he's got all the, the big microphones and TV screens and everything. Uh, all we've got is a small little, um, well, we're not the only place on the earth. I mean, come on. I mean, there's a lot of not serene. But we're very, very small in number. It's almost like the religions are, their whole existence is to keep you away from obeying the covenant the way the Jews were given the covenant and the way that they failed to uh, obey it. And replacement theology has made Israel the Christians. And that's really the goal of it, you know. And I just want you to understand we're not to argue with them, you know, because if they're doing what they think is right, they're not sinning, you know. It isn't about being right, it's about not judging, you know. And uh, being correct as you can in your heart, that's, uh, that's more important because you're, you're going to be judged by what you know, you know, and what you didn't know. And if you're in error, if I'm in error about that, then uh, I'll repent and I'm not going to have he ever said anything against those that did it the, the right way. So if those say, if anybody says, well, you're going to be damned because of your false teachings over whatever, then let it not be said that I ever did that to them or, or you ever did that to them. But uh, we're going to be judged by our words and the measure that we use to judge others. You know, that's important. But anyway, these fall festivals are harvest. It's about the harvest of the earth. They're just shadows. And this seventh month is critical. Christians have completely ignored that. Uh, I don't know what, how that could be, but I guess it's, you know, it's because it's an invention of men. It's a religion that was invented by men, and it's hence uh, fragmented into all these different de denominations. And they don't understand it, but uh, it's written right there in Leviticus chapter 16 and uh, no, the Leviticus chapter 23 and Deuteronomy chapter 16. The festivals are right there. You know, all you have to do is look at them. But they, they don't want to be associated with Israel because, see, with, as Christianity developed, Constantine and the fathers were repulsed by anything that had any scent or flavor of anything Jewish, as they understood it. So the anti-Semitism was rampant in the Christian fathers. Uh, in fact, before Rome became a prominent part of Christianity, Alexandria, Egypt was the repository of all human knowledge. The, the, in fact, the library at Alexandria was burned down at least three times because, you know, it had a lot of knowledge there, and I think that was intentional, you know. Uh, the Christians probably were trying to burn it down because it had evidence in there, and they wanted to destroy that evidence. Because you see Nazis running around burning giant books and libraries, uh, you know, because evidence exists in those books, you know. Um, throughout all time, books have been burned to expunge the knowledge that they contain to basically get people down to a controllable, because the first ones that would be executed in a lot of wars were the intelligent teachers and philosophers. They were the first ones that had to be killed, you know. And anybody that had any contact with their writings had to be killed too. But persecution is part of our lives. I mean, we can expect basically the, the highest powers on earth to come down hard on us if we ever grew in strength. Because we're a threat, you know. But, you know, not because of physical, but because of the, the truth. The truth is a threat. Okay, well, I'm going to have to get it. Uh -huh. <laughs>